Uh, I love when I get a chance to participate in these honor seminars because they give me a chance to do things and think about things that I may not otherwise be able to. That uh, doesn't quite overlap with the, the courses that I normally teach or, or other things that I'm asked to do on campus. The hardest part each time for me though seems to be sort of trying to figure out what to do. And at first glance, the notion of like giving a talk about birds from the point of view of somebody who teaches English literature seems like it would be super easy, right? There's just so much to choose from. Um, you've got Poe's Raven, Keats's Nightingale, Shelley's Skylark, Coleridge's Albatross. Uh, if you don't want to go the poetic route, you could go a little more modern uh, and talk about Tolkien's Eagles or about J.K. Rowling's Owls or about Hitchcock's film, The Birds. Or you could go in an even different direction and go sort of pop culture and talk about road runners or mocking jays or porgs, the little things from the Star Wars film, or chocobos from Final Fantasy. Like there, there's a million different directions that you could go in. And so I sat and I thought for a while and, and I decided not to take any of those routes, but take a much more basic path. And instead just to think about the words that we use almost on a daily basis and how uh, laden they are with references to birds and to things related to birds. So when we, when we think about looking at something from a general perspective, we say that we take a bird's eye view. We could call a person that we don't like very much bird-brained. We teach our kids about the birds and the bees. We talk about people who eat like birds. If we don't like something, we say that it's for the birds. So when we go to concerts, maybe we scream out free bird to the band that's up on the stage. Uh, we talk about pecking orders and being a rare bird, about wetting our beaks or about winging it. And then there's a whole host of ancient sort of proverbs about early birds that catch worms and a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. You can kill two birds with one stone or maybe a little birdie came to you and told you something secret. You can take someone under your wing. And then beyond just sort of the language of birds in general, we have things that are tied to specific kinds of birds. So for example, chickens. We talk about how you can chicken out, how you can play chicken. We say that someone has chicken legs, our kids get chicken pox. When we get older ourselves, we say we're not a spring chicken anymore. Uh, when we're feeling stressed out, we run around like a chicken with our head cut off. When we encounter a difficult question, maybe we ask why did the chicken cross the road? Uh, when things don't go our way, we say maybe that the chickens have come home to roost. When we are worrying about the future, we tell ourselves don't count your chickens before they hatch. Even beyond just specific to chickens, we talk about female chickens. We can say things like a mad as a wet hen, or he's a hen-pecked husband, or she acts like a mother hen, or something is as scarce as hen's teeth. There's a whole host of language that we use about ducks. We talk about ugly ducklings, lame duck presidents, sitting ducks, dead ducks. If we're really good at something, we're, we're like a duck to water. When something doesn't bother us, it's like water off a duck's back. We talk about eagles, about being eagle-eyed, or maybe we're a legal eagle, or maybe we're spread eagle. Maybe we're loose as a goose, or we're off on a wild goose chase, or our goose is cooked, or we killed the goose that laid the golden egg, or what's good for the goose is good for the gander. You can be a silly goose. We get goose bumps. Hopefully we don't goose step. We have a whole bunch of phrases about turkeys. You can act like a turkey, you can lay a turkey, you can talk turkey, you can quit something cold turkey. If something's super easy, maybe it's a turkey shoot. It's not just birds though, it's also eggs. You can be a good egg or a bad egg. You can have egg on your face. You can lay an egg if you have a bad performance. You can egg someone on. You don't like somebody, maybe you tell them, go suck an egg. Uh, you build a nest egg. Last one there is a rotten egg. If you're worried about disturbing somebody, you can walk on eggshells. Uh, feathers, too. You can have a feather in your cap. You can feather your nest. You could be in fine feather. You can feel light as a feather. Birds of a feather flock together. And every once in a while, you can be so astounded that you could be knocked down by a feather. 
These are all obvious sorts of things. We probably don't think about them very much, but it's still right there obvious on the surface of things, the connection to birds in general or to a specific type of bird or to something that's associated with birds like eggs or with feathers. But if you do even a little more digging, then you could find that our language is just sort of loaded down with words that we don't even realize have these connections to birds. One good example is the word auspicious. We talk about an auspicious occasion. Uh, this is an auspicious moment. An athlete goes out as a rookie in his first game. He has a, a tremendous performance, and we say that you know, this was an auspicious beginning to his career. If you go back and you trace the roots of this word, it goes all the way back to Latin. There's a word auspex, which is a contraction of another word, with his, which is avispex, which is, literally means bird observer. Because a long time ago, you have priests that are watching birds looking for omens from the gods and trying to figure out what things mean and how we should govern ourselves based on these little signs and symbols and signals that are hidden in the natural world. Another excellent example is the word cajole. Doesn't get used all that much today, but it means to persuade, especially by sustained coaxing or flattery. Like after much cajoling, I finally convinced all of my students to turn in their homework on time. This word, if we go back all the way to the 1640s, comes from a French word, which has pretty much the same meaning, but has a separate meaning too, which means to specifically to chatter like a jay in a cage. And cajole is wonderful because it plays on both senses of that word or that phrase, because you get the incessant sort of chattering of the bird, but in this case, it's the person who's listening to it that ends up getting sort of manipulated and put in a cage. Another good example is the word jinx, which goes all the way back to the 1690s. We're probably most familiar with this word from sort of a childish game that we will play where when two people say the exact same word at the exact same time, one of them yells out jinx and then the other one isn't allowed to speak until either their name is said or somebody buys them a Coke or something. I don't really remember what the rules are. An older meaning of this is a person or a thing that brings bad luck. And if you trace it back farther and farther and farther, you go back to the Greek word for a wry neck bird, which is a little bird that, that has a sort of serpentine movement to its neck. It looks kind of freaky, and because of that, it has always been associated with witchcraft. So somehow you go from a bird with a weird neck to witchcraft to sort of putting a jinx or a hex on somebody. One last example is uh, the word pedigree. We think about this probably most often with dogs as opposed to with birds, right? Uh, tracing back some sort of purebred animal, thinking about a genealogical table or a chart. But if you look back, this is, comes from a French word combining the word for foot and the word for crane. Because if you go back and you look in old manuscripts and look at genealogical tables, they kind of look like birds' feet. And I didn't know any of this when I sat down to start this talk. And I think for me that's been the point of it. It's not just to come here on the weekend and, and stand on the stage and be filmed saying things that I know already. I try to, for whatever it's worth, to take these opportunities to actually learn something. And I think that's the number one thing that we try to impress upon our students in everything that they do, in every class, in every moment, in every activity, outside the classroom as well, to try to see it as a moment for learning, as an opportunity to improve themselves, to pick up something that they maybe didn't know already. Even beyond that, though, I think, and I'm well aware that a lot of this is sort of limited to just an English nerd and somebody who really cares about words. But I think it's especially important at this particular moment in time, in our history, in our culture, when we don't really seem to care all that much about words anymore. Where we use them very loosely and carelessly without thinking about what they mean, without thinking about where they come from 
where we tend to think about ourselves as individuals who are cut off from everybody else around us, where if we actually stop and think about the words that we use on a daily basis, we can see how they connect us across cultures and across time and across history uh, to people that we've never even imagined. So to me, the, the takeaway, the sort of so what at the end of all of this is to just think a little more carefully about the words that you use and how you use them, and maybe we, we might be a lot better off as a whole. Thank you.